2021. Welcome to the AI ML Data Science Track. My name is Eli, your host, and our co-host today is Stephen. We will be moderating the chat and Q&A uh, for you during the session. Today we have our guest, Jyotika Singh, and she will be talking about building features and machine learning models for audio signals. Jessica Singh is the VP of Data Science at ICX Media, where she mentors her team as they research on NLP, feature engineering, machine learning, data analytics, distributed computing, social media data, and audiences data using Python. Her efforts in driving data science at ICX, along with the introduction of new methods and processes, have led to, the, to patented technology and strongly contributed to reduced costs, securing of new clients, and achieving high double-digit revenue growth in the past year with a positive EBI TDA. Outside her work, she continues to uh, contribute to open source and has a speaker at uh, and is a speaker at multiple conferences across the globe to share her findings and work with the data science community. She is passionate about encouraging women in STEM and continues mentorship efforts to support the topic. Without further ado, I'll hand this over to the speaker. Thanks for being here, Joe. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. All right, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about building features and machine learning models for audio signals. Before diving right in, just a quick introduction. Uh, Eli gave a wonderful introduction, but I am the VP of Data Science at i6 Media. I've attached my social media handles here as I'll be posting the slide deck on my Twitter uh, after conference. And also, in case anybody is not able to ask any questions now during the conference and you know something that you want to ask me or just discuss later on, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, I also have this upcoming book with CRC Press uh, scheduled to release next year, which is about natural language processing in the real world, uh, which will include uh, industrial applications across 10 plus industry verticals and practical implementations for most common use cases of NLP. So throughout this talk, uh, I'm gonna be covering a few different topics. First, just a machine learning overview. Uh, second, what is audio signal and introducing audio as data. The audio transformations and features that play an important role in building machine learning models. And then we'll, I'll present some tools, some open source Python tools that can be used to uh, essentially create features and building machine learning models. And lastly, I'll walk through some audio classification examples that are built using the tools discussed previously. So let's look at machine learning overview. At a very high level, there are a few stages of the whole machine learning process. A data phase, which has data collection, uh, data cleaning and transformation as its components. Data collection, as in sometimes you have the data available and sometimes you know you may have to scrape it or collect it via some APIs or also use some openly available data sets. And once you have the data, more often than not, it's not in the cleanest state uh, of its all and you need to do some sort of processing to either remove noise or clean and pre-process your data before you can finally transform it into what we call features, which is the input to machine learning models and training machine learning models. Once a model is built, there's an evaluation phase. And based on the findings from the evaluation phase, again, data decisions can be altered, such as do we need more data, any further cleaning or transformation steps. So this is machine learning at a high level. And then we saw you know, features are the transformations of any data to a numerical representation. So that is exactly what features is. It's used as an input for machine learning models, and it highly depends on the type of data. Let's see what that means. So when you have a text corpus, something that works really well to represent this text into numerical vectors or features is word to vec So essentially, for uh, any words or phrases in your corpus, you can convert them into some vector representation, which is numerical representation of the word in the space itself. But now let's say I were to pass something like random numbers or audio or any other type of data. I'm not likely to get any meaningful representation from word to vec right? Because word to vec is so specific to text um, and data of that sort. So there are different feature generation methods suitable for different types of data. And there are also different ones for audio specifically. And that is what we'll be diving into soon. So starting off with audio, what is audio? 
essentially it's a signal that vibrates in the audible frequency range that humans are able to hear. So what happens is, for example, now that I'm talking, uh, these, uh, and you can hear me through your speakers. So essentially uh, what's coming out of the speakers is converted into air pressure signals, which are your collects and then channels it through your ear canal and through all the components of the ear. And then further, that is sent as uh, you know signals to your brain for further recognition because your brain understands meaning of certain things and you know what this means essentially. It's not just plain audio, but this word actually has a meaning that you know because you've heard of, heard of it in the past. So that's how the entire process of hearing works and that's how audio signals essentially work in that respect. There are many great MATLAB tools uh, for audio processing and digital signal processing in general, speech processing. And there's so much research going on very actively. And then what that research yields is a lot of great utilizations in MATLAB, right? Uh, with time, you know, there's a lot of updates that are happening in the Python community as well. Uh, but this, uh, the primary focus is MATLAB and there's still a lot of things that you may find easily in MATLAB, but not in Python. And considering such gaps in the community, you know, there's a potential to create code in Python that can be leveraged for audio processing tasks. Uh, on those lines is one of the projects that I uh, you know, started about two years ago when I had to create particular features from audio and I was not able to find anything already implemented in uh, Python for it. Given that machine learning is you know, really popular and Python is the language of choice for a lot of machine learning tasks, uh, it was very favorable to have that implementation in Python and then I open sourced it so that you know, it can be available uh, to the rest of the community as well. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. But essentially that is audio signal and the chart that you see there is a basic time series representation of an audio. Now let's talk about audio transformation and features. This is uh, just a slide with a lot of terms on it. Uh, we'll not be talking about all of them, but I certainly wanted there to be a placeholder for multiple things and multiple features and multiple important transformation terms related to audio. So in case somebody wants to look up other terms that we could not talk about, you know, this could be a good reference. And also towards the end of the slide deck is a resources slide where I've attached further reading materials for things that we speak, but also things that we cannot speak about during this talk. Two of the important terms of audio transformation are spectrum and capstrum. Now, what is spectrum? It's essentially this audio signal in the frequency domain. What does that mean and how does this happen? Is that your audio signal is passed through what we call Fourier transform and the resultant is your signal in frequency domain, which is a spectrum. Now Fourier transform uh, essentially works to highlight what frequencies are in your signal, in your audio signal. And if you've heard of Fourier series, and even if not, it's essentially how to represent your signal in terms of sum of sines and cosines. So you know, that's how we get the frequencies essentially. And so that is spectrum and that finds great applications in audio processing in general. Now, uh, there's another term called skepstrum and that is also really good and it helps uh, extract a lot of useful meaning from the audio. And mathematically, the spectrum is passed through a log magnitude phase to reduce amplitude difference of the signal, followed by an inverse Fourier transform and the result in a kepstrom. Now, kepstrom is neither in time domain nor in frequency domain. Why not in time domain? You know, even though we take inverse Fourier transform, it's because of that log magnitude step. And why not in frequency domain? Because we did take inverse Fourier transform. So it is referred to sometimes as the quefrency domain. It's neither time nor frequency. Here's how a basic visualization looks like of a, a particular vowel in time domain on your upper left, and then the spectrum of the vowel, the capstrum, and then the first 20 capstral coefficients. So the first sometimes 13, sometimes 20 capstrum coefficients actually form great features for you know, many machine learning uh, tasks related to audio. Another representation is called spectrogram, which is a way to visualize both frequency and time in a similar plot. Uh, there are a lot of uh, reading uh, essentially technologies here and even people are able to look at how the colors vary in spectrogram and sort of guess if it's a vowel spoken or you know something else spoken like other sounds like T or D. Essentially, it's a visual way of representing uh, signal strength and as it varies over time, and it allows you to see different frequencies that are combined to produce a sound. 
Uh, this is not only a good visualization uh, in terms of you know how you can see or analyze an audio, but also otherwise, as um, a lot of times audio machine learning tasks are seen in a way where it can be treated as an image classification task, because once you have a spectrogram, uh, that really tells you about the signal in terms of time and frequency. So it contains important information about the audio. And then this is passed into some image classification uh, models to essentially learn what is being spoken. So we've spoken about frequency and all of that, but why is that important, right? Uh, so let's, let's look at it this way. When we are dealing with images, uh, what we see is a particular color, right, in an image. And how we make a computer understand what color it could be? Well, behind an image is all those RGB values, pixel values, and each correspond to some sort of a different color shade. And you know, we know we see this, so these numbers correspond to this shade. Right, so that's how it works. It's inspired by essentially how it actually works. Uh, so it's very similar for how we hear as well. What happens is there is this uh, structure in your ear, which is called cochlea. It is fluid filled, spiral shaped, and has tiny little hairs uh, that are of varying length. Now what happens is when audio is passed through the ear, the shorter hair in the cochlea resonate with the higher frequencies as the fluid moves, and then the higher, uh, uh, the longer hair resonate with the lower frequencies. So it's almost like the, the signal, the audio signal is transformed into the frequency domain, uh, and then later on it's processed by the brain. So it's almost like our ear is a natural Fourier transform analyzer, and that's where the inspiration comes from. And that's why you know, we are interested in different frequencies of sounds. Now coming to features, uh, there are some very great Kepstrel related features. Uh, that are very useful in a lot of audio classification tasks, like speech classification, music genre classification, and whatnot. So essentially, uh, what happens is the spectrum of a signal is passed through the Mel scale filter bank, which is all those triangles that you see. And you may notice the triangles keep getting wider and wider. It's just, again, inspired by how humans hear and you know how the human auditory system becomes less frequency selective above one kilohertz or so. So the triangles keep getting wider and wider. Uh, the log magnitude is taken to reduce amplitude differences and then discrete cosine transform the resultant is mfcc feature now discrete cosine transform essentially helps get the shape of the signal rather than the smaller uh, smaller things or smaller sharp edges that are happening around audio signal it's because those smaller differences are just considered more like noise and the shape of the signal is what is of interest dct also finds application in things like jpeg compression for the similar reasons so that was MFCC feature. There's also one feature called GFCC, which is gamma tone frequency capsule coefficient. Similar process, except now we are using the gamma tone filter bank. And you see the filter looks a little bit different from what the MFCC, the MEL uh, frequent, uh, filter bank looked like. And the primary uh, inspiration for gamma tone filter bank is this is also used as a front end simulation of the cochlea. So this even more closely represents how humans uh, hear and filter noise. Uh, so essentially that principle, again, to replicate more of how human hearing works. And this is the GFCC feature, which also finds a lot of application and also has been found to be more noise robust. Here's a visualization of MFCC features and GFCC features side by side, just for uh, reference. And we can see, uh, you know, they're basically conveying different information, but even for the same signal. So it's not like one is a derivative of the other, but they do uh, uh, convey different meanings, essentially. There are many, many other features. Uh, you know, some are called LF LPCC, which is linear prediction capsule coefficient, BFCC, bar frequency, PNCC, power normalized. There's so many other features that, you know, we wouldn't be talking about, but I want to list them again here. And they are, uh, you know, found very useful in a lot of speech processing tasks. There are other features like chroma, which you know is more uh, re really helpful in music-related uh, tasks when the audio has music. A lot of other spectral features, which is again uh, uh, we spoke about spectrum, so features related to that uh, that found that find really great applications in building machine learning models. Now let's talk about tools. Uh, we spoke about all these features and how they are produced and mathematically how to get to them. Does that mean every time you want to use MFCC or GFCC, you have to code up any of those calculations and perform all of those steps? 
The good news is no, because a lot of these things are already implemented in Python, and we have great tools that we can leverage uh, to do the same. Uh, there are different tools for getting features, different types of features. Um, you can use any kind of backend for building machine learning models. There are some just specifically for reading audio in Python. And then visualization can be using other libraries and then just using standard visualization libraries once you have features or anything that you want to actually plot and visualize. Uh, Pi Audio Processing is uh, my work in progress library, which I started about two years ago when I was actually wanted to extract GFCC features uh, and use it with uh, some of the scikit-learn classifiers. And I did not, I was not able to find a good implementation of that in Python. Um, nothing that worked out. So what I did was uh, I took some MATLAB code and I converted that to Python. And then I made it available to the open source community. Uh, so essentially, that's one of the features this project contains. But there are a lot of other things as well. It's a, essentially an audio analysis and classification library in Python. Um, anything starting from basic functions like converting audio formats uh, to audio visualization in both time and frequency domains, audio cleaning to remove silent and or low activity segments, such as cropping audio feature extraction like MFCC, GFCC, spectral, and chroma features, um, integration with scikit-learn class classifiers with hyperparameter tuning, uh, and it gives you confusion matrices and any results of those uh, classifiers that you want to train. And then it also offers three different pre-trained audio classification models that can be used as a baseline. Uh, here's an example of the low activity segment removal process. So you may have a signal which has some speech in it, but you know, in the whatever setting it was recorded in, uh, it has some silence or basically nothing, just background noise portion, your speech, and then silence again. And you may want to basically zoom in on just the speech uh, segment of the signal. Uh, so something like this, where removing low seg segments, low activity segments with a adjustable threshold, so you can get rid of more or less, just depending on your application, and that's uh, essentially visualizations uh, that are that are using scikit-learn in the backend, uh, and that's what Pi Audio Processing essentially imports as dependencies to, to give that capability in one place. Uh, we remember seeing this, right? We spoke about machine learning at a high level. And let's see how machine learning at a high level for audio may be like. So starting from the data collection phase, uh, you can use your own data set if you have any available, or one of the many publicly available data sets. And I've attached a great link to this article that uh, mentions so many of these audio data sets. Uh, it will be there in the resources slides towards the end. Furthermore, data cleaning, uh, you know, converting between audio formats or just using other low activity segment removal functions that we spoke about earlier. And then data transformation to get the features, to use the Pi Audio Processing Extract Features module to get features like MFCC, GFCC, or even a combination of those features. Coming to training and evaluation of the models, uh, we can use a run classification module to essentially train models and also evaluate models at the same time. Now, if you want to use Pi Audio Processing or essentially any audio processing task that you want to do using the library, you, know, you can ask yourself such questions. So when you have an audio signal, what do you want to do with it? Uh, do you want to convert any formats? If so, you know, use the convert audio module. If not, does it need to be cleaned? Use the clean module. If not, do you want to create a scikit-learn classifier? Yes, use the run classification module. If not, uh, do you just want to extract features and then use it with your own custom classifier or custom backend? You can do that as well. You can just use extract features. Uh, or do you not want, not want to do any of that and you just want to classify your audio with an existing pre-trained model? That can be done as well using uh, essentially all the instructions that are clearly mentioned in the readme, where you can just specify the model that you want to use once you have the library installed. And lastly, do you want to visualize your audio? If so, you can use the plot functionality. If, let's say, none of that is satisfying your use case, then it's an open source project for the community. Uh, you know, all contributions in terms of any code that you want to commit, uh, any tickets that you want to take up, or any tickets that you want to just even create, or let us know if there's stuff that you know you would love to see in the open source community that you can't find, and that's not currently a functionality of the library. And you know, we'll be happy to essentially work on that and also accept any work that you want to do by contributing to the library. 
So it's compatible with uh, Python 3.6, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, there are you know, several ways to get started, either using pip or just cloning the GitHub repository along with setup instructions in README. Uh, features options would be GFCC, MFCC, Spectral, and Chroma, with LPCC coming soon in progress. And the classifier, scikit-learn classifiers, are SVM random forest, logistic regression, KNN gradient boosting, and extra trees. The cleaning, uh, you know, once we spoke about the low activity segment removal, but there's another process which essentially helps get rid of uh, noise that's ongoing in your signal as well. Essentially detecting more silent portions of the audio, taking that spectrum and then subtracting it through the whole signal. So that's called spectral subtraction. Very basic, uh, you know, very popular, very baseline type of a uh, methodology. And, you know, that's also in progress. Uh, various types of audio format conversions, uh, visualizations, time series, spectrograms, and then the pre-trained models would be speech versus music. So classifier to classify between speech and music. Uh, one for music genre classification that uh, can classify audio between 10 music genre classes. And then a speech music board sound classifier, which can help in classify an audio between these three different classes. So going on to audio classification, now we have learned about the tool, we've learned about you know, audio and the features involved and what they really are, some of the names. Uh, so let's try to implement all of that in some you know, real use cases. Uh, before jumping right into it, because there's several different notations of confusion matrix with the x-axis and y-axis, you know, different sometimes. Uh, basically, confusion matrix is a visualization of the performance of your algorithm. And in this case, we'll be uh, talking about the actual classes uh, as rows and the predicted classes as column. And, you know, that's how we'll be looking at the visualizations going forward. So the first example we'll look at is audio type classification. Uh, here, we are going to be classifying an audio into speech, music, or birds category. So we are using 50 samples for each of these three classes, a total of 150 samples for training. Uh, we are going to be keeping the classifier constant at SVM right now and just compare between different features. And then for testing, we'll be using speech, music, and birds, uh, all three of them, 14 samples each. So first, we uh, use MFCC feature and train the model. And we see the confusion matrix for training looks decent, uh, looks pretty good. Uh, we pass the same model through to test data, and we see uh, we have 13 out of 14 for music correctly classified and pretty much 100% for speech and birds. Looks like a pretty good model, right? And let's see the plots here that we have uh, just for reference for speech, music versus bird. And we see, uh, well, you know, how the different features look like. And yeah, there are different patterns. So that definitely did help our model learn these representations and decipher between these different signals. Now, for experimentation purposes, let's train a separate model with GFCC feature, and everything else remains the same. And we see this confusion matrix also looks good, and the test results are also pretty good. Um, and so this actually portrays that GFCC on its own does convey information that helps our model decipher between the three classes, and so does MFCC, uh, even when used separately. Because just, these two just to interrupt about uh, eight more minutes uh, before questions. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, so because of this, because they're representing different information, sometimes they're used in conjunction and that really proves to be beneficial as well. So here, when we use them together, we see, well, great confusion matrix again and great test results as well. Next example we look at is music genre classification. Uh, using the GTZAN data set here, which is a very popular data set, consisting of 10 music classes, uh, blues, classical, country, hip hop, disco, jazz, metal, pop, reggae, and rock, with 80 samples each for training and 20 samples each for testing. First, we uh, try MFCC features with classifier constant at SVM, and let's see how that looks like. So this is the training confusion matrix, and we see like there's a mixed performance. Something like classical seems to be doing pretty well, but something like rock uh, or country, or even disco, not so much, or there's a mixed sense of performance here from the training a confusion matrix. When run on the testing confusion matrix, we see, uh, again, mixed set of results. Classical doing pretty well, but you know, disco, blues, reggae, a lot of uh, performances that are not really doing as well. Now, it really depends on a use case. If uh, you, know, you only care about particular classes of genres, not all, 
this may be uh, an okay model to you know set as your baseline but let's see if you can improve this model just by changing the features so in this next experiment we'll be uh, using mfcc fcc spectra and chroma together in the model and keeping classifier as svm and here uh, when we see the training confusion matrix we see uh, essentially every single uh, number here looks now better there's still some lower numbers here, but it's all better than the previous slide that we saw. And even for testing, we have some significant improvements. We had nine more correct classification for DISCO, uh, and you know, basically plus numbers for most of the classes here. So we see there's definitely improvement that happened when we considered features uh, that are not just MFCC and added to the feature pool. Now, there's so many other things that can be done, right? Trying out different classifiers if you don't want to experiment further with features. So we did that. We uh, have SVM that we had on the previous slide as baseline. And we also tried random forest, logistic regression, KNN, gradient boosting. And we see there are different set of results. Some that we may not even want to consider you know, further experimenting with. But it looks like logistic regression and SVM, even random forest and GB to some extent, they have pretty close performances here that we see in these numbers. Uh, taking a very larger view, if you want to analyze every single confusion matrix for training at separately, we see how so many different classes go wrong in KNN, gradient boosting, random forest. But logistic regression is more comparable with SVM. Uh, slight differences in any improvements that they are, uh, but essentially very comparable. Furthering the experiment running this on the test data and seeing the number of correct classifications out of 20, uh, we again see here that now SVM is doing a little bit better than logistic regression. Again, comparable models, but there are some classes like blues where we have 11 out of 20 correctly classified with SVM versus logistic regression, only six out of uh, 20. Further analysis can be done using uh, you know, a confusion matrix analysis on the testing data itself and, and analyzing where which class is going wrong. So maybe pop is good, but you know, do we need to check the data that we have for go and maybe some other classes, seeing where they are going wrong? So essentially, data quantity, data quality, the kind of features we use, the kind of classifiers we use, and then just for more about the data in the sense that um, how clean is it, or you know, some music genres may have audio associated with that. So does that make a difference in any classification model? Last example is a location classification from audio. So uh, we have uh, two lo spoken, uh, location names, London and Boston. Certain similarities in terms of number of syllables, number of characters that compose these location names. And we see the plots also look different. So one may think that, well, they look different. Certainly a machine should be able to take this and classify between the two classes. However, uh, when we see this visualization right here, Everything on the left is London and everything on the right is Boston because so many people speak differently with different accents and different pauses. And so the visualization is going to look uh, different every single time. So two experiments, quick experiments here. One is we are using uh, 23 samples for London and Boston and training only on female voice samples and hoping to classify male voice samples with this with 17 samples each for testing. Uh, so here we see first MFCC, uh, a mixed kind of confusion matrix, and only eight out of 17 correctly classified from test data for London and nine for Boston. Going further for GFCC, we have a little bit better performance here. Uh, and now it's, it's better in terms of test as well, where we have 13 out of 17 for London and Boston both. Combining uh, spectral features with GFCC, we have another even further improvement to the confusion matrix and also the test data results with now 14 out of 17 correctly classified for Boston and 15 out of 17 for London. Now, if we make the training data more representative with including now both male and female voice samples, we see here now in the first experiment itself, the MFCC model, there are improvements already when we made changes to the training data and made it more representative. In this case, again, GFCC is still doing better uh, than MFCC alone, and GFCC plus spectral is also you know, having a better performance in terms of both training and uh, testing results. Here's the more, most promised resource slides, attaching some uh, links to different papers, some music genre classification, uh, the early work that used MFCC features, uh, audio data sets, 
and some other resources that I hope people find helpful. Finally, I want to say thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. It's uh, been a wonderful experience talking here. So please, please ask your questions in the Q&A. Uh, Stephen has one. Uh, does your library implement regression models which are adapted to functional predictors, such as audio signals? So the library uh, does not implement regression models right now. Uh, it's mainly focused on classification models. But that's a really great question. Um, and you know, if that's of interest, uh, again, it's an open source project. Would really recommend uh, you know contributing by creating any GitHub issues there, and even maybe contributing in terms of code of anybody who might be interested. So thank you so much for the question. Cool. We have another question. Uh, how about adding music-specific stuff like multi-instrument transcription? Well, that's a good question as well. And you know, if I'm sensing that correctly, uh, I'm not sure if it's about essentially classifying between different instruments. Uh, it looks like it's probably hinting towards that. So that is a very good question. And because it, this, these different instruments have different types of sounds and essentially how the human ear perceives it, uh, MFCC has actually found a lot of uh, uh, use in music genre and just music classification in general as well, if, even if not just genre. So I think it's definitely worth a shot or uh, trying MFCC features for any such uh, you know, work or any music instrument transcription sort of a thing. Uh, there's a, another question. Um, are there any links to the model you mentioned where the spectrogram is fed directly into the image models? Uh, let's see. Um, you know, if not, I'll be posting, I'll be updating this with certain really good walkthroughs and articles uh, before I post out this slide on Twitter. But essentially, uh, people use people have used Keras and you know whatnot. Essentially, after they have the spectrogram and use that as input uh, to you know train a model. So I'll be sure to update the links before I post it out. But there are some really great ones that you know I hope you find helpful. Your, your library and your work on it is, is pretty fantastic. So I really have Thank to you. say. Oh, uh, uh, I think a, a follow up for the question on transcription was um, uh, it's not classification, it's turning audio into musical scores for multiple instruments, um, kind of equivalent to multiple speaker transcription. OK, well, that's an interesting application, too. I know that uh, speaker transcription, especially multiple speaker transcription, is a, is a big topic as well. I've personally not uh, you know, looked into the use case of, of essentially multiple instruments transcription, but I'm sure there's some sort of inspiration we can draw from uh, the speaker transcription project. And I've seen the use of GFCC features there as well to understand the signals better. And you know, I can certainly uh, update this link to this really great paper that was published um, sometime after 2016 for very similar use cases. So I hope that helps. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, any thoughts on features which be best represent the contents of music? Uh, so when you say contents, uh, I'm not sure what exactly that means. Maybe like just the music and audio separately or just ex just the notes of the music. Uh, but I'm going to answer uh, it just based on you know the assumption here that I have. Uh, I would again say, OK, thank you for clearing that. Uh, I would again say MFCC has found great application. In fact, there was this paper which was published early in 2002 where MFCC features were used for a lot of different music uh, music related tasks to understand the music signal and even even things like you know what I presented with the genre classification and essentially just finding representations within the signals and try to decipher between different ones. So MFCC and that's a paper I've also attached on the resources slides. So I think that would be a good read, uh, and that may uh, be you know some inspiration there that you may be able to draw for uh, you know your project. We've got a, a few more minutes, so please ask your questions. We've just got a shout out that says, thank you for a great presentation and a very cool Python package. I will check it thank out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
I appreciate it. Uh, about how long, so you said about two years you've been working on Pi Audio processing? Yeah, that's that's the first time I essentially open sourced the code I had. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, since then I, uh, when, as time passed, I sort of started noticing some interest and citations of the tool in uh, different people's work. So that sort of uh, motivated me further to keep maintaining it and adding <laughs> features. Uh, so essentially that's been my motivation. Uh, what, what? Uh, drove you to make it do everything in one package, so the cleaning, the... Yeah, uh, the oh, that's a great question. So personally, uh, speaking from my experience, when I was trying to uh, perform various audio classification tasks, uh, I had to go through those steps too, because you know uh, there, there are multiple things that you may want to do to your signal before it's ready for classification. And just based on that, I found myself using either a lot of different libraries or just writing, writing a lot of code that either use some existing tools along, along with some custom code or otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. So I guess that's uh, the inspiration for trying to make it a little bit of a one-stop place, one-stop shop, which has integrations with other great tools as well to get all functionality in one place. Less importing. Yeah, very cool. So uh, the f uh, follow up question about this, how do you use uh, your work uh, in the context of your current role? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, hmm. when I uh, was doing my master's at UCLA, that's where I was really looking into speech signals and signal processing. So it all started from there. In terms of my current role in my uh, company, uh, as, uh, as, as a VP of data science, we don't actively do audio processing, but we used to, we had this one project where we just wanted to uh, analyze a video or different videos and analyze it between visual uh, components and also audio components. So to being able to identify sounds such as, uh, you know, wind or vehicles, uh, you know, to try to essentially add to the intelligence that we have around videos. Uh, not just in terms of how people describe the videos in terms of text descriptions, but also what you see and what you hear. Um, the idea was just to essentially gain intelligence around content. So we are able to make intelligent recommendations like A, B, and C components work really well for this type of content uh, and share that with content creators. So that was the use case. One minute left if we have any. Uh... Last questions. Uh, if there's an audio clip with multiple sounds, how do you clean it into separate clips? Very, very good question. So if it's an audio with multiple sounds that are sort of pasted back to back, so like sound one, sound two, sound three, that way, you know, just clip it. Uh, essentially based on, it can be automated in a way that when your signal suddenly changes into a totally different type of magnitudes or you know suddenly now there's just more going on and there are changes like that, then it can be just clipped like based on essentially cropping of the signal. But if it's anything like, let's say all sounds are mixed into the same uh, audio and they're all in the background, that's a more of a challenging problem. Um, and that essentially even goes for things like detecting speech from noisy samples and cleaning the samples. Uh, so, so that's that. I, I'm going to have to close this out. Thank you, Jyotika, for your presentation you. and the attendees for great questions and interaction during the session. Uh, you can contact the speaker directly uh, if there are any further questions regarding the topic. Please provide your feedback using the form that we'll provide in the chat box. Thank you again, everyone, for joining today's presentation. And I hope you have gained some insights from the session. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for being a part of this year's DataCon LA. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.